argues further down on page 4, the rest of 388 onto 389, that it makes sense to investigate them separately, to set up a division of labor in our intellectual investigation into, on the one hand, the empirical conditions of human beings, human nature, human information, human psychology, and on the other hand, the pure a priori part, the moral, strictly speaking, or the principles of pure practical reason on the other hand. Um, of course, a complete theory of ethics, a complete uh, metaphysics and morals will require both of these, but he thinks it's important to separate out these two components. And at the bottom of um, page 4, so we'll write at 389, here he says, in this work, um, we are interested in the pure. So very bottom of page four, I limit the question presented just to this. Is it not thought to be of the utmost necessity to work out for once, finally, a pure moral philosophy, completely cleansed of everything that might be in some way empirical and belongs to anthropology? So the point is not that anthropology, practical empirical, sorry, practical anthropology, empirical investigation of human nature is unimportant. It's that he thinks we need to separate out these two get clear about each of them first before we have to go. Okay. Um, so why is he so sure that there has to be this pure part? Why is he so confident that ethics, morality, has anything but an empirical investigation. Any thoughts about that? He says something about it on page 5 there. So this is still that 389. So, so far I've been saying that there's both a pure and empirical component. He thinks that we need to separate them out, investigate them separately. Here he's going to be concentrating, it's a groundwork, so he's going to be concentrating on the pure part. And my question is, why does he think that it's important to, why does he think that there is a pure part? Why is he confident that there is an a priori component to morality? Understanding morality, think about it. So it's obvious that there's going to be a pure component to it. Maybe not quite so obvious as a polytheism. So why would we think that? Well, I'll keep reading. Everyone must admit that a law <coughs> is to hold moral. obligation must carry with it absolute necessity. So his thought was something like this. Um, um, in our ordinary thinking about morality, we think that there are moral obligations that we have, that there are duties that we have, that there are moral requirements that that uh, apply to us. Um, and the question here is the ground for those obligations. On what basis are those obligations or duties grounded on? And Kant's thought is this. If they are grounded on empirical conditions, um, if they are grounded on 
the fact that some condition happens to obtain or not, well then, they will be conditional. They'll be contingent on those conditions of pain. And yet, he wants to say, that in our common sense thought about morality, guys, in our common sense thought about morality, we think that they are binding on us, that they're necessary, that they are requirements of us. And we're not going to have any, I said this last time, we don't have any empirical uh, impressions on necessity. So think about this. Um, think about it this way. Um, our obligation, so take a take a case. Our obligation to tell the truth. Maybe we think we have a we think we have a moral obligation to tell the truth. Well, that means that it's required of us to tell the truth. It's necessary that we tell the truth. It's not something that's dependent on our feeling like telling the truth. It's not something that's dependent on our wanting to tell the truth having a desire to tell the truth, thinking that telling the truth will be beneficial to us in some way. If the obligation to tell the truth was contingent in that way, if it was dependent on our feeling like it, or wanting to, or having a desire, or having it be beneficial to us, it wouldn't be necessary. It wouldn't be a requirement of us. It wouldn't be binding on us. It would be conditional, it would be contingent on those empirical conditions holding. So, confidence that our common sense thought about morality as being binding, as being a requirement, as making demands on us, as being necessary, means that it can't be contingent on certain empirical conditions obtained. So sometimes we might not feel like telling the truth. We might not want to tell the truth. We might not have the desire to tell the truth. Telling the truth might be bad for our own self-interest, but we still have a moral obligation to do this. Um, so uh, even if we're very confident that we will be able to get away with breaking a promise or get away with being immoral, we shouldn't. So that's the kind of necessity that he's talking about. And therefore, confidence. The grounds for that obligation can't depend on empirical circumstances. They must be pure. Um, so the grounds here means the justification. Uh, um, So let me put it as a as a conditional thing. So um, we wouldn't put this way. Uh, we wouldn't be talking about morality uh, if we thought that in some sense it was optional, or if in some sense we thought it held only for some people, or held only in certain circumstances. So if there are empirical conditions that uh, some principle depends on, then it's not, that principle is not a principle of morality, or not a fundamental principle of morality. So um, I'll, I'll put it the other way around. It may, may, maybe it will turn out, maybe we're going to fail to find any principles that bind unconditionally. Maybe it will turn out that we can't identify any principles that bind with necessity. Maybe it will turn out that the only principles we can find are principles that bind contingently on the basis of empirical circumstances. In that case, we will not have been able to give a vindication of morality. Because morality tells us what we have to do, what we must do, what's required of us. Okay, so, so 
our common sense understanding of morality says that it's binding and necessary, not based on any contingent empirical condition. Uh, and therefore, its justification has to be pure, has to be, or at least the fundamental principle has to be pure, has to be non-empirical. So what I just said is that that doesn't show that there are such principles, but if there are principles of morality, fundamental principles of morality, they have to be operated on Otherwise, they wouldn't be necessary. They wouldn't be binding. They wouldn't be obligatory. It would be what? Conditional. Conditional on those empirical circumstances. Okay, um, so um, he thinks there obviously must be a pure part because it's obvious that morality binds with necessity, imposes requirements on us. So this doesn't show that there is such a thing. What it shows is that there has to be such a thing if there's going to be an account of morality. Tell by your look that you may have lost it. So let me see if there are questions. So this is the argument that if we're talking about morality, there has to be a pure part. There has to be a, a, an a priori component. Because if we're talking about morality, we're talking about something that purports to, that claims to be necessary to impose requirements on us. Not something that applies when we feel like it or when we have a certain empirical desire or to certain types of people. This is something that has to apply with necessity to everyone. And if it applies with necessity to everyone, what it is that is applying to us has to not be dependent on any empirical conditions. Um, so, moral principles can't be grounded in empirical facts about human beings. So this is what he's saying, uh, just put it down. The ground of obligation here, the basis for the necessity of moral principles must not be sought in the nature of the human being or in the circumstances of the world in which he is placed, but a priori solely in concepts of pure reason, and that any other prescription that is founded on principles of mere experience can indeed be called a practical rule, he says, but never a moral law. A practical rule that says, well, if you're in these empirical circumstances, it might make sense to do that. But that's not going to be something that binds unconditionally on us, binds necessarily on us, binds with necessity on us. Um, okay, so the thought is that uh, there may be, there may be empirical conditions that hold uh, on all human beings, that are shared by human beings. So these would be universal for human beings. If we discovered some empirical fact about human nature that everybody shared, some empirical fact about the desires that all human beings shared, for example. Well, this would be empirical, and there would be a kind of universality for us, but they would still be empirical. And because they would still be empirical, they would not carry the right kind of necessity or requirement. And morality, as I've been saying now, applies with necessity. So the fundamental principles of morality, he thinks, can't be grounded empirically in discoverable facts about um, human nature. And sometimes the way Kant makes this point is by saying that the principles of pure practical reason aren't